Leopards are Africa's most elusive big cat. But one man and one extraordinary leopard have formed a lifelong bond and open a window into the world of these mysterious predators. This is leopard territory. 17,000 hectares of bush that is home to more than 20 of Africa's most enigmatic big cats. This leopard dynasty is the lifeblood of South Africa's Lundalozi Game Reserve in the south of the Great Kruger National Park. The leopards here have been filmed and studied for almost three decades. Each cat is intimately known. And unlike most places, they are not shy of people. But there is one leopard that has taken her relationship with humans to a new level. And one man that has dedicated almost two decades of his life to filming her. John Vardy, or JV, has been following leopards since childhood. But his relationship with this one is different. He calls her Manana, Shangan for mother. And he shares a trust with her that is uncanny for her species. Okay, girlie. Most leopards are aggressive and unpredictable and will attack without warning. But JV is able to sit only meters from Manana, unharmed. Their extraordinary bond was made possible by an encounter more than a decade before Manana was born. The year is 1979. JV and his tracker, Elman Mlongu, are on the trail of a leopard. They've just started out as wildlife cameramen, and so far, the secret of cats have proved difficult to catch on camera. But today, they hit gold. A mother leopard and her cubs. Sightings like this usually last long enough for the mother to get her cubs out of sight. But not this time. This leopard allows them to watch her without concern. They name her the mother, and JV vows to document her life on camera. Over the next 12 years, she allows them to film every aspect of her life. The mother leopard was the first leopard that showed me that it was possible to have a relationship, a close relationship with the leopard. She unlocked the secret world of the leopard to me. But one night, JV watches as that world is torn apart. Lions pursue the mother after a kill, and she makes a deadly miscalculation. She hauls her carcass up a tree, but it's too low. Lions are too big to climb high. But the 150 kilogram killer gets into the low branches easily. Cornered, the mother has no option but to meet her fate on the ground. dawn, JV and Elman scour the mother's territory and find what they fear.
their leopard, brutally injured, dying. Her wounds cut to the bone. They watch as life slips from her torn body, and their window into the world of leopards closes. JV and Elman try to follow other leopards, particularly the mother's daughter, named Tugwan Female. But Tugwan's nature is a far cry from her mother's. She's temperamental and aggressive, and they track her with extreme caution. So when they see her leave to hunt, they recognize a rare opportunity to get down to her den and see if she has cubs. What JV finds changes his life. A tiny female cub emerges from the den. It's Manana, ten days old. JV's window into the world of leopards opens once more. As a single parent, Tugwan must hunt, or she and the cubs will starve. So, in their first weeks of life, Manana and her brother are often left unguarded at the den. Lions and hyenas kill the offspring of other predators to eliminate the competition. And unguarded leopard cubs are soft targets. But the dense bush and cavernous rocks of the Tugwan riverbed protect this den like a fortress. Allowing Manana and her brother to hone their skills in relative safety. New creatures awaken their earliest hunting instincts. But it takes a little longer to grow into climbing. makes perfect, and soon the trees become their preferred playground. And everything in them, fair game. Manana soon learns that tackling prey that bites and hisses is harder than it looks. She heads down after easier prey. As the cubs grow, so too will the size of their prey, until at one year, they will be ready to catch full-grown antelope alone. As adults, the treetops of Londolozi will become their domain. The dense woodlands are perfect leopard habitat, abounding with a diversity of prey. But with that prey comes other, larger predators. Manana learns early in her solitary adult life that catching prey is only the first hurdle. Keeping it is always a far tougher task.
The death rattle of the Impala goes up like a flag, alerting wandering hyenas to the kill. They'll stop at nothing for a free meal. And with a bite that can crack bone, they make deadly enemies. Manana is in mortal danger. Seconds after Manana makes the kill, spotted hyenas surround her. Alone and outnumbered, she can't afford to fight. The hyenas, on the other hand, can't help fighting. A strict hierarchy gut feeding. With so many mouths, underlings must be kept out by force. Soon, the feeding frenzy turns into a riot, allowing Manana to sneak in and steal back her carcass. This time, she hauls it out of reach before the hyenas know what's happened. She eats her fill while she can. But hyenas are relentless. A scout remains to stake out the tree and wait for Manana to make a mistake. Leopards inevitably lose kills to predators. But when Manana bears her first litter, the stakes change. Predators are a constant, mortal threat to leopard cubs. Here in the Kruger National Park, they kill one and two infants. But even at only four years old, Manana proves to be an excellent mother. Her dense sights are all but invisible. She moves the cubs every few days to keep the predators guessing. Never staying in one den long enough to build up a telltale scent trail. But there is one enemy that Manana cannot outwit. And JV knows it all too well. A female leopard, which we called Sunset Bend female, contracted psychoptic mange. And I believed at that time that it was a natural process and that I should not interfere. And I watched and filmed while she deteriorated and eventually died. And filming her body, I realized I had it within my power to save her life, and I'd let her go. When Manana and her cubs contract the same mage, he is forced to make a controversial decision. Sarcoptic mange is caused by a mite that eats away the skin. In the wild, it's a death sentence. But this time, JV won't stand by and watch Manana die. To treat the mange, JV will dart a drug called Ivermectin directly into Manana and her cubs. Elman tracks Manana to a dense grove of trees. One cub is on the ground below. 
the other in the low branches. They must move fast. The darts will hurt. Manana may see it as an attack on her and the cubs, and fight back. One of the few times when the dart hit Manana that I saw her really angry. is worth it. Three weeks later, Manana and the Cubs make a full recovery. JV's intervention gives Manana another 14 years of life. And her Cubs survive the ordeal to become some of Lundalozzi's most successful leopards. But Manana's next litter is not so lucky. A new threat terrorizes her territory. Male leopards. Territorial males kill cubs that aren't theirs so that females can bear their cubs instead. When two competing males invade Londolozi from either side, it turns into a killing spree, as they repeatedly destroy each other's offspring. After losing two consecutive litters, Manana makes a move to end the slaughter. She seeks out one of the males and entices him to mate. Like domestic cats, Microscopic spines on the male's genitalia make mating a painful process for the female. A process she must repeat every 50 minutes, day and night, for up to five days straight. The repeated couplings force Manana's body to ovulate and help to ensure conception. When the ordeal finally ends, she crosses her territory to find the other male and endures it all over again. By mating with both males, Manana deceives them into thinking the resulting cubs will be theirs. It's an extraordinary strategy that only a few lepers have ever been seen to employ. And it pays off. Three months later, she has a single tiny cub. Usually, there are two or three cubs in a litter. Lions may abandon single cubs to bear larger litters. But Manana chooses to keep this only child. The rocky den hides many inaccessible crevices, and its perimeter is guarded by dense thorn trees. A lion or hyena will have to work hard to reach the cub. Manana leaves it safely concealed in the rocks and heads off to hunt.
But today, Manan is not the only predator on the prowl. There is one killer that can breach the den's defenses. And it's moving in, whilst Manana's attentions are elsewhere. Hunt failed. Manana heads home. She gives a soft contact call for her cub. But there is no answer. Something is wrong. It takes only a second to recognize the killer. An African rock python, swollen with a cub-sized meal. Manana risks her own life as she attacks her cub's killer. The python retreats into the thorns. But Manana will not give up. For three hours, she lies silently, staking out the python's cave. At last, her patience pays off. The injured python finally makes a move. Manana is ready for the next round. She waits until it's clear of the cave. But there's no battle. A built-in reflex forces the snake to relinquish its hard-won meal. Under stress, pythons regurgitate their prey to shed the extra weight for a speedy escape. But Manana has abandoned the attack. She's got what she came for. After the python disgorged her cub, I thought Manana would go after that python and kill it. But there was no act of revenge. All she wanted was her tiny cub back. We tend to think of leopards as instinctive and animals without emotion. That is completely untrue. Manana carries the body away from the den and begins to consume it. Manana knows that her cub is gone. By eating that cub, 
I believe that she was going through a ritual. She was going through a ceremony, disposing of the cup. It was one of the most emotional times I ever spent with her. And then, incredibly, for four days, she called for a cub that she knew was already dead. As a filmmaker, it's hard to just turn your camera on and capture the scene because it cuts very, very deep. Manana's grief is tangible, but losing cubs is a reality all leopard mothers must face. Of Manana's eight litters, only four cubs survived to adulthood. She can't afford to grieve for long. She must ensure her own survival. And to do so, she must hunt. Her 15 meter vantage gives her a bird's eye view on potential prey. An Apollo breaks from the herd. Manana has her target. Now, it's all down to timing. She makes it look easy, but this aerial assault is rarely witnessed. It takes a perfect set of circumstances. The right prey in the right place. Perfect timing, perfect precision. But it means nothing until her belly is full. She needs to get the kill off the ground quickly. But even the trees aren't always safe. Lions are the leopard's number one enemy in Africa. They're three times her size, and unlike hyenas, lions can climb. Like her grandmother, it's a threat she can't escape. Manana retreats to the highest, thinnest branches and watches as she loses yet another kill. To defend it would be suicide. The pride's forces grow. Numbers are not always a strength. In a hungry pride, every scrap of meat must be fought for. With the enemy distracted, Manana makes a swift exit. Barely is one opportunity lost, then another presents itself. A cheetah is on the hunt. They may look similar, but the cheetah is a very different animal to Manana. 
They're matched in weight. But the cheetah's long, streamlined body is built for speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour. While Manana's is built for stealth and strength. This is one opponent Manana can intimidate. Leopards only pick fights they can win, except when it comes to territory. Females will fight to the death for their rights to prey, habitat, and ample den sites. In her prime, Manana is a formidable opponent. She holds Lundalozi's best territory for most of her life. But keeping it means fighting often. And risking severe injury. As Manana grows older, those injuries begin to take their toll. She's now an old leopard of 16. She's lived more than four years longer than most wild leopards, and her body is shutting down. She can no longer afford to fight for territory. must watch, humbled, as younger, fitter females mark on her turf and claim the best of her territory. A familiar whoop gets her attention. A much-needed meal could await nearby. Scavenging from the hyenas that plagued her youth now helps to keep her alive as an old lady. As usual, they fight over who has the right to feed. It's getting tougher and tougher for her to hunt, so if she can scavenge some meat from this kill, It'll keep it going for a while. And as the meat gets separated and spread around, she may have a chance to pick up a piece of meat and jump into a tree. But while there's so many hyenas, it's very, very dangerous for her to go in now. She walks a dangerous tightrope. Scavenged meat could keep her alive, but if she's discovered, the hyenas may attack. She's safe in a tree, but she's trapped. 
The hyenas will show no mercy if she comes down. Manana waits for hours in the blazing sun. Until the hyena matriarch makes off with the last of the carcass. With the hyenas fat and fed, it's safe to come down at last. The ordeal has cost her precious energy. Energy she will struggle to replace. Six months down the line, every day of life for Manana is one that JV doesn't expect. He heads out regularly to check up on her. She's in the treetops, and she's seen something. She'll eat anything she can catch now, no matter how small. Manana used to be so fast, so strong, but now she's nearly 17. She's had to adapt to catching smaller prey. She's caught this monitor lizard, but still surviving, still using every trick to ensure her survival. She's very old. She can't have long to go. JV moves to sit with her, perhaps for the last time. Okay, my goody. In just a few weeks, she will be 17. A record age for a wild leopard. The equivalent of 85 human years old. Okay, go. <laughs> he chuffs to her. A sound of reassurance that she would use to calm her cubs. Okay, go. Okay, girl. Okay, girl. He does not fear her, nor she him. They have earned each other's trust. There are few people who could lie a body's length from a wild leopard. But JV knows his time with her is drawing to a close. Cheetahs generally fail once for every successful kill. The Wachini mother will get another chance. Immediately, she moves back to where she hid her hungry cubs, knowing that every time she leaves them, they are vulnerable to predators. So far, these three cubs have been lucky. Cheetah mothers have a difficult time raising young. Unlike lions and hyenas, cheetah males move away after mating, leaving the mother to raise her cubs alone. A cheetah mother can give birth to up to eight young, but the average litter size is three or four. Of these smaller litters, only one cub stands a good chance of surviving. Cubs can't open their eyes for the first two weeks, and even then, they're dependent on their mother for everything. They stay hidden for up to six weeks, and they continue to suckle for two months. 
Then they're ready to share in their mother's kills. By that time, the cubs wear a pale mantle, perhaps to disguise them as honey badgers, a fierce and aggressive plains forager that predators tend to avoid. In contrast to the lone cheetah, wildebeest and zebra move en masse, and that poses a different set of challenges. As they arrive in the wet south, the thirsty herds need to drink, and they refuel at the marshes of Ndutu. As more and more charge toward the long-awaited water, chaos ensues. The discipline of the migration formed over so many miles quickly falls apart. Babies have a hard time sticking to their parents. They get disoriented quickly. Within seconds, a calf loses its mother. The tall grass doesn't help, obscuring its vision. And in the commotion, all mothers look the same. The calf is particularly vulnerable. It won't survive long without milk, and in the extreme heat, it'll weaken fast. It approaches a passing adult, hopefully, but gets rejected firmly. the flank of a zebra, but there's no sympathy shown here either. And its problems are just beginning. Another cheetah hides in the woodland. The wildebeest eventually leave the Undutu marsh, with the calf still separated from its mother. As they move into the verge of the woodland, the cheetah senses that an easy meal could be on the way. She's worked these woods before, and she's totally focused. She passed up the Grant's gazelle, and pulling down a big zebra is out of the question. The cat waits. For this hungry cheetah, wildebeest calf is a welcome meal. But she can't eat yet. She needs to suffocate it as quietly as possible so other predators don't steal her catch. The shorter the struggle, the better. And even then, she'll have to wait. After running at 50 miles per hour for 300 yards, her heart races at 250 beats per minute. Practically gasping for air, she sucks in more than two breaths per second. She can't eat until her breathing calms. While she recovers, she's on high alert, scanning the land for potential rivals for her hard-won meal. In a few minutes, her system has settled enough for her to search for a secure place to dine. She's a great hunter, but she has no firepower to defend her kill. And her options for hiding are limited. Because unlike other cats, 
cheetahs cannot fully retract their claws. Though crucial to maintain high-speed grip, the claws are constantly worn, so cheetahs can't rely on climbing to escape other predators. She eventually settles on a small block of shade in the lee of a low acacia. The instant she's sure she's safe, she tears into her meal. Camouflaged in the open scrub, she'll gorge as fast as possible. If she's chased off, she wants to at least reap some benefit from her efforts. If they're lucky, cheetahs manage to eat only 40% of their kills before another predator chases them off. This time, she's left in peace. But life is not always this easy. Near the Wachini Plain, distant roaring greets a new day. Not far from the mother cheetah and her cubs, a male lion calls out to his pride. His sensitive ears listen closely for his family's response from the other side of the lake. Boisterous lions behave so differently from secretive, silent cheetahs. Exposed on the open plains and marshes of Andutu, lions find it hard to hunt. They almost seem ungainly compared to the lithe cheetah. More heavily built and not nearly as quick, they rely on a longer stalk and usually hunt in early morning or at night. The distant zebras grow edgy as this lion unwisely tries to close in under the midday sun, a time better suited to the faster cheetah. She shouldn't have bothered. As the zebra flee, the lioness wearily begins her long, hot walk back to the shade of the tree line. Because they hunt for the pride, individual lions can risk the occasional long shot. Another member will always pick up the slack and eventually make a kill. A cheetah hunting alone can't afford that luxury. Cheetahs have the gift of precision. Lions have the gift of versatility making the best of most situations. They form an especially lethal gang, able to take down large prey. If the cheetah is the sprinter of the Serengeti, the lion is the wrestler. Back on the plains, the wildebeest migration progresses. While some herds graze, Others follow the clouds north for another year. Their presence here is temporary. They could be miles away by morning. The Wachini mother and her three cubs have no time to waste as their prey steadily slips beyond their reach. While the wildebeest move on, a few zebra straggle in the Wachini mother's territory, but that doesn't make them easy targets. They migrate with the wildebeest, but they're wiser and much more observant. Undaunted, the cheetah mother is still on the prowl. Yesterday's failed wildebeest attempt has left her family hungrier. Desperation hangs in the air, but she has to keep her focus. commits to a target and begins to stalk. Singling out the herd's smallest, waiting for it to stray. Then it's zero to 60 in just a few strides.
perhaps intimidated by the mass of fleeing zebra, she gives up again. Another chance wasted. Watching from the edge of the woodland is a mother leopard. She too is a lone parent, but she takes a different approach than her slimmer cousin. First off, her cubs have better cover for hiding. They can stay concealed indefinitely, so the mother can hunt without worry. This one snagged a wildebeest calf. She stashes her kill high in a tree, out of hyenas and lions' reach. She can dine at leisure and save some for later. She has so much time to eat that she can remove the hair from the carcass before she starts, an indulgence a cheetah wouldn't dream of. She'll spend the day eating and snoozing, lounging high in the branches while her cubs stay hidden. Compared to the cheetah, what a life. The Wachini mother, still separated from her cubs, searches desperately for them. Another vulnerable moment for the defenseless young. This family hasn't eaten for four days now, but the mother's new priority is to find her babies. As she searches, she lucks upon another opportunity. A small gazelle dawdles within striking range. With no cubs around, the cheetah stands a better chance. opportunities, but the failed attempt minutes earlier has sapped her energy. She's out of steam. Even by cheetah standards, she's not doing well. And she's even farther from her cubs, a recurring problem for this working mother. But things only get worse. The zebra's tolerance of the mother is wearing thin. They take matters into their own hands, chasing her off putting even more distance between her and her cubs and leaving them dangerously exposed on the open plain. The panic-stricken cubs don't dive for cover, but call desperately. But their mother's now almost a mile away. And their cries attract some unwanted attention. A clan of hyenas moves in to investigate. Hyenas instinctively kill cheetah cubs, not for food, but rather to erase future hunting competition. The hyenas come in for the kill. She has to reach the cubs before they do. The cubs calling works. Mother comes to the rescue. They're still hungry, but happily reunited. Although the hyenas are bigger and stronger than the mother, they're not really looking for a fight. They go off to make trouble elsewhere. Hyenas are happy to scavenge or even steal a meal from a careless predator, but they're also effective killers on their own. The departing wildebeest provide an opportunity. The hyenas loiter along the edge of the herds until they spot their victim. 
Then they break into a loping run. Hyenas, unlike the cheetah, are built for endurance. They take turns in running their prey to exhaustion. This chase turns out to be a rousing mission. And when they can't shake loose a suitably weak or slow wildebeest, they give up, for now. But their upsetting presence sends this wildebeest into a frenzied display. clan reunites. They're very social and live in a tight family structure managed by a female. Young hyenas remain in dens guarded by an adult while the clan is out on long hunts. In further contrast to the cheetah, hyenas are hard as nails. They'll eat just about anything. While the cheetah typically eats less than half of its kill, hyenas can devour more than 80% of a carcass. Muscular jaws crunch through heavy joints. With a half ton of sustained pressure, this animal clips through an antelope leg like a stick of candy. The hyena can digest solid bone, and it doesn't stop there. This hungry fellow swallows a hoof. Only the skull and horns are spared. If the cheetah is the sports car of the Serengeti, then the hyena is the garbage truck. If left to eat undisturbed, Cheetahs gorge themselves, almost to the point of immobility. This female, who worked so hard for her kill, can barely move and simply cannot finish her meal. It won't go to waste. Another group of carnivores waits in the wings. Vultures commute to the migration route, picking up what the predators leave behind. They nest high in the gorges of the Rift Valley and cover up to 125 miles round trip. Every morning, they leave for the long flight out to the Indutu area. Surprisingly, old world vultures like these can't smell. They rely solely on their eyesight to locate carcasses. One by one, they drop onto the remains of a freshly killed zebra. Each species has its niche in the Serengeti machine. But unlike the big cats, different vulture species work together to divvy up a carcass. The curved protruding necks of the Rupel's griffin and white-backed vultures easily snake their way under the skin of the carcass to feed on the flesh inside. This is their special skill. On a particularly popular corpse, interspecies fights break out to win prime positions. And sometimes, big lappet-faced vultures drop from the sky. They are the thugs of the vulture world, bigger, more demanding, throwing their weight around to dominate the other species. These birds have strong, muscular necks and huge, sharp beaks for pulling sinew and severing ligaments. They're built for efficiency, 
not looks. And they help all the vultures by breaking the carcass into smaller bits. No single species of vulture can be efficient on its own. They need the support and expertise of the others. Unlike the cheetah, they cannot work alone. Over 700,000 successful years, cheetahs have honed their skills on the savanna. The mix of open woodland and unobstructed grassland perfectly suits the cheetah's focused hunting style. And though the Wachini mother may be having a hard time hunting these days, she clearly was healthy enough to give birth to three energetic cubs and raise them for months. But now, aside from her hunting slump, she has another issue to deal with. Female cheetahs have big home ranges here. A female might claim as much as 150 square miles. But these ranges overlap, so contact with other cheetahs is inevitable. A floater arrives on the Wachini Plain, a wandering mother with older cubs, and she's on foreign ground. The Wachini mother spots her, and they stare each other down from a distance. It's a stalemate. The intruder tires of the standoff and lies down in the grass. Astoundingly, the Wachini mother retreats. She's been through a challenging time and shies away from conflict. Cheetahs go to a lot of trouble to avoid each other, and this one's no different. She moves deeper into her own territory. The cubs are confused by the mother's retreat. They have a lot to learn about their species' personal space. Having unwittingly repelled the Wachini mother, the intruder's family relaxes in the shade. Her young, the cheetah equivalent of teenagers, still have a cub-like curiosity. They begin to stalk a new sort of prey. The filming vehicle. The young, either naive or lion-hearted, get busy exploring. The truck becomes a giant cat toy. Despite the humans inside it, the cubs feel no threat. Their mother is not convinced. This cub spots a victim. It's the windproof microphone. The thrill of a first kill drives them, and he bags his prey. So much for an inconspicuous film crew. They have to break cover and attempt to retrieve the mic. Natural history filmmakers never want to be part of the story. But the turn of events illustrates the boldness of cheetah cubs, in contrast to their timid mother, who sits this one out. Cheetah are hungry. While being timid is no sin, it can work against the cheetah. Their cautious nature puts them on shaky ground especially against more aggressive savanna dwellers. Not only hyenas, lions, and angry zebra, but some other surprising rivals. An unassuming warthog, generally a menu item, can turn ugly and pose a serious threat to this young cheetah. Faster than it looks and built like a toothed battering ram, this hot-headed hog is one beast the cheetah doesn't want to mess with. The warthog's after undisturbed foraging rights for her family and won't let the cheetah stand in her way.
The indignity of having to fend off potential prey doesn't sit well with this young male. The spat continues, but the warthogs stand their ground. They're just too intimidating, eventually chasing the cat deeper into the brush. For the moment, the warthogs are brimming with confidence, but they're about to get their comeuppance. The timid behavior of the cheetahs hunting alone is just one side of their story. In other circumstances, these large cats are mean, lean, and formidable. On the small plain near the warthog's territory, six cheetah males have joined forces. Coalitions form when sub-adults band together after their mothers leave, often their brothers. Males in coalitions are on average 22 pounds heavier than lone males, thanks to their ability to hunt more effectively. As a group, they can defend territories better and repel lions and hyenas that may try to steal a hard-won kill. For males in these partnerships, the plains are ripe with hunting opportunities. As fate would have it, the happy warthog family forages nearby, oblivious to any threat. Twelve eyes lock onto them. The big male spots them, but after their recent victory, the warthogs are downright smug. The hogs have dinner on their minds, but so do the cheetahs. quickly. A hopeful jackal approaches, but he's not welcome. One cheetah escorts it away while the others continue feeding. It's hard to believe these aggressive cheetahs are the same species as the Wachini mother. These males have strength in numbers and the whole group benefits. Back on the short grass plains, the rain clouds have swung northwest, dragging the scent of moisture along with them. For the Wachini mother, time is rapidly running out. The wildebeest are moving away, leaving the Undutu area, following the sprouting grass. As they move off the plain and back into the nearby woodland, another coalition waits. Strategically positioned, low and inconspicuous, they prepare for the streams of wildebeest to move closer. Some wildebeest smell the predators, and they're edgy. But soon enough, the wind dies, and the cheetah's scent doesn't drift. The stakes are higher here. The prey is bigger. The dominant male begins to run. He locks onto a target and singles it out. They 
have to stop it from returning to the herd. But in a display of extraordinary bravery, this wildebeest turns to fight. It has more stamina than the cheetahs, and it makes it back to the safety of the herd. The cheetahs make their best attempt, but this time, it doesn't pay off. However, all's not lost. In the chaos, a calf gets separated. The third coalition male sees it and gives chase. The wayward calf has no chance against the coalition as the law of the savanna plays out. They drag the struggling calf into the shade, turning a failed hunt into a meal, enjoying the fruits of their teamwork. As they tear into the carcass, the remaining wildebeest continue north toward greener pastures. It's unlikely that they'll return this year. The wet season here is over. The track spreaders of Ndutu can only follow them so far. The herds will move over a hundred miles beyond the territories of the cheetahs. The departing migration will only make things harder for the Wachini mother as the parade of prey passes by. Hunting will get more difficult now. As she competes against stronger predators for a shrinking food source, it's easy to believe she's fallen victim to her own specialization. But the cheetah's speed and stealth have gotten her family this far. The timid, struggling, working mother and the aggressive, efficient coalitions are two parts of a whole. The coalitions have the skills to exploit bigger prey. The mother will do everything she can to raise her cubs. Only by looking at them together can we really get a picture of the state of their species. Not just fast on their feet, but built to survive. The mother cheetah will come out of her slump and once again make the most of what the savanna offers. Though all her cubs may not make it, the ones that do may form a coalition of their own, continuing the line of specialized survivors, built for speed, despite the price.